I'm trying to stick to the schedule I said some time ago, but at times I will bump into games that I want to cover that requires a lot more effort than just your average run of the mill game, which I can play for an hour or two, make a video and be perfectly happy with that. In those cases, I will take the necessary time required in order to make a presentable gameplay video. It doesn't have to be perfect, I'm not worried about it being perfect in any way, shape or form, but it doesn't hurt if it looks like I've played the game once or twice. In those cases, I will go for quality over quantity as much as I'm able, which will sometimes cause delays. On that note, onwards to the feature. Some 30 years ago, my brother grabbed hold of me and uh, asked if I would be willing to go down to the local game supplier and buy some games for him. And I said, yeah, of course, okay. no sweat for me. So I went down to the shop, which happened to be a photo video shop. And they had a huge unit filled with cheap range games. For the Commodore 64, Armistrad, Spectrum, whatever else that might have been available. And I was browsing uh, through the cheap range games and I didn't like to see anything that I felt was worth purchasing. The shop also had a display of more expensive games. Something that I knew my brother wasn't necessarily a fan of because of course if you buy an expensive game and it sucks, then no money is down the drain, but if you buy multiple cheap games, games, there's a chance that you will enjoy at least one or two of them. But I was thinking, you know what, if he hates it, I'll just have to compensate him for it. So I bought it, and that was, of course, Turrican. And the look at my brother's face wasn't exactly positive when I came home and told him the lawyer's story. But as I said to him, you know what, give it a bash, if you hate it, I'll, I'll compensate you. And he gave it a bash, and um, I don't know whether things have changed since, but at that time at least it became his second most favorite Kono 64 game behind Pirates. So it wasn't such a bad purchase after all. Turrican is a run and gun platform action game and contains quite a bit of optional exploration if that floats your boat. In Turrican 2 it is emphasized that the name Turrican is the name of the souk. I cannot remember whether that is the case for the original Turrican as well, but at your disposal, disposal disposal I think it's called, you have two main weapon types, a spread shot and a laser shot. The spread shot is weaker but will hit in wider area and the laser is stronger but will only hit in a straight line. You also have access to a photo game type where you need a lightning gun, the beam weapon you've seen me swing around from time to time which you can rotate a full 360 degrees. 
it may seem a bit wimpy at the moment, but as you get in uh, power ups, you can extend its range to go completely off screen. This is a tool you'll be using quite a lot, but something to bear in mind is that you are locked in place while using it. So, it is something to be mindful of. You also have the option to turn into basically a rotating sword blade three times per life, and you will mainly use that to reach otherwise inaccessible areas. The effect is somewhat cool, and it is tempting sometimes to uh, fool around with it. But if you spend them all, and you suddenly need, to, suddenly even need to enter a specific area, then you will have to lose your life in order to get them restocked. By the way, I was going for a secret bonus area thing and missed the jump. Oh. You can't swim, by the way. That is not part of the suit. No flippers. If we quickly go through the interface, a bottom left side, you have uh, a red man icon thing, which is part of the Rainbow Arts logo. And above that, you have the three indicators indicating your ability to turn into the Soul Blade mode. To the right of the icon, the man icon thing, is a number which is your lives. Further to the right of that is your continues, or yeah, the number indicating your continues. And anyone familiar with this game will probably notice that I've actually used the one continue. I started the game and I screwed up, so I decided to just restart the game, lower continue, and make a better gameplay video out of it. Further to the right of that you have your timer, which is sufficiently generous for most levels if you are not spending an awful lot of time fooling around. To the right of that again you have a gem indicator. Those gems have multiple functions, mainly to boost your beat the game bonus if you manage to beat the game, but they will also grant extra continues after having gathered a certain amount of them. A showcase in one of the inaccessible areas, by the way. These bonus blocks, you've probably seen me destroy some of them for the parts they contain, but in the case of this, you want to avoid destroying them in order to access these extra lives. If you fall down, the boxes will despawn, so it's a one shot. And a lot of the very generous bonus areas will be one shot attempts per game. If you fail them, you will find it very, very hard, if not impossible, to gain access to them again. More normal bonus areas are not as punishing, but uh, mainly the areas that grant you three, four, five lives will be of such a type. Back to the interface and we can cover extra weapons available. To the right of the gem indicator you have the bomb marker, which is basically a smart bomb thing. If you fire it, fire it at a single enemy, it will destroy that enemy, but if it hits a hard surface like a wall, it will effectively work as a smart bomb. If you have revealed or unrevealed bonus boxes, be mindful that the smart bomb will destroy those as well. It is something that needs to be uh, kept in mind. So right after the bomb indicator you have your mine time bomb thing, which is uh, something you can put down and it will detonate after a few seconds, damaging grounded enemies. The game's definition of what is a grounded enemy and what is not a grounded enemy can be interesting and it will not necessarily affect enemy types you think might be affected by. To the right of that you have your power lines, which is basically a line that will be fired off from both sides of the suit, and they will extend all the way to each side of the screen, damaging and or destroying enemies caught by 
the lines. From a technical point of view, let's start with the graphics. The graphics are very, very, very high quality by and large. The individual levels are distinctively unique. There are five levels, each divided into two or three sub-levels, depending on the level you are going to, and each are uniquely themed. They are very, very different from one another, and you will, within one full level, you will see a repeat, but between the five levels, there are no repeat. So, everything is new and exciting as you explore it. Scrolling is spot on, controls spot on, and while um, I've been reading various comments about various games or various systems, there was someone indicating that Commodore computers could not handle proper hit detection. Um, I would like to emphasize that the Commodore computers had no issue handling proper hit detection. A lot of Commodore computer programmers had issues handling proper hit detection. Hit detection in this game is spot on. You never feel that you get hit when you shouldn't, and you never feel that you don't get hit or don't hit when you should. So, the sound design is of a very, very high quality. The sound effects are great, very, very satisfying, even though the lightning guns would be a bit headachey after using it for a while. But I suppose you are basically handling a lightning bolt, so it is supposed to have some sort of power behind it. What music there is in this game, which is mainly the title music, the high score entry music, the PC game music, and two jetpack levels, which I will not show in this video. Using those areas are, is even of a very, very high quality. I can appreciate that sit chip music is not to everyone's liking, but for me personally, no matter how much I regard the Amiga to be my absolute favorite computer of all time, I have the greatest respect for sit music. And what I like so much about it is the fact that it's very distinctively sit chip music. A bit like you can always recognize a Mike Oldfield track as being a Mike Oldfield track. You can, barring crappy tunes of course, uh, you can always recognize a sit tune being a sit tune. It has a very distinct sound and it is a sound that I fully enjoy. And of course when it's handled with respect and proficiency, then it can make some absolutely amazing sounds and uh, as I was saying, the music in this game is of a very very high quality. In closing, Turrican was in many ways a bit of a marvel when it comes to Kono 64 games because there was a lot of things on display in, in this game that were considered to be impossible to do, do on the Condor 64. Something that Manfred Trans quite uh, strongly disproved in the making of this game. Very large sprites and other such elements. Despite it being a bit pricey for its time, the game was worth every single penny. More games should be made of this quality and every gamer would be a happy gamer. And on that note, I'm going to exit this level and say thanks for watching, take care, and uh, see you next time. Bye bye for now.